Thank you for joining us today on Body Ecology Living with me, Donna Gates. Today we're going to be talking with David Wolf. This is a man I love to talk with. His energy and enthusiasm sparks immediate change in people's lives. He has a master's degree in nutrition and a background in science and mechanical engineering. David is considered one of the world's top authorities on natural health, beauty, nutrition, herbalism, chocolate, and organic superfoods. Leading the field with his vision, mission, education, and business, David has over 15 years of dedicated experience and understanding of the inner workings, the delicate chemistry, and the hardcore mechanics of the human body. With a lifelong passion for inspiring people to have the best day ever, David has touched the hearts and minds of hundreds of thousands of people across the world. I would actually say that's an understatement because David's had a huge influence on making healthy fun for millions of people who've seen him on TV. You've probably seen him on TV showing you how to make smoothies with the Nutribullet. So thank you very much, David, for joining us today. So happy to be with you, Donna. Always a pleasure and excited to talk about this great subject that we're going to talk about today. Well, when I was at the Women's Wellness Conference, I was as a, as a speaker, so I was extremely grateful to be there. And it was a huge conference this year. Um, I was able to debut information on nutritional genomics, which I was so excited because it's a new field. And you were talking about colors in foods, and I was so busy I didn't get a chance to talk to you because I'm so interested in this subject. I've always you know, picked foods and, and on my plate, you'll see I have a lot of color, but can you start teaching us about why is color important in food? I mean, well, first of all, don't even go there. Let's find out how you even started into this topic of color in foods. I think it started out because of Ron T. Garden and Ron T. Garden all those years ago had told me that black foods are jing supporting. And that means that they're longevity supporting foods that are naturally black. And there's not a whole lot of them. There's black olives. We're familiar with that. I'm here in the tropics. We've got black sapote, which is a type of persimmon. It's a tropical persimmon, one of my favorites, wow. indigenous to Mexico. Can you There's, only get that there in Hawaii where you are? You can, Well, actually, you know what? You go to Mexico City. Mexico City is so advanced in so many ways. You can get black sapote blended with soursop or graviola as a juice in glass at the market in Mexico City. Would you spell that word for us? For people yeah, that so, are taking so notes. We've got there's two two ones that I two that I threw at you really quick there. Um black sapoti. Sapoti is spelled S A P O T Y, or sometimes it's spelled S A P O T E. And I believe it derives from the Spanish, which it means like a, a big soft fruit. It's kind of what it that's the translation in one language. I think it's a Spanish. I'm not sure. It could be it could be also an indigenous language. And then the other one I threw out was soursop or graviola. Now, soursop is spelled like sour, S-O-U-R-S-O-P, soursop. Very popular in the Caribbean. That's where it's originally from. And or we call it sometimes graviola. And you may have heard that, G-R-A-V-I-O-L-A. Graviola is a very powerful – it's a basically an ally in the fight against cancer. Yeah. And it's, and it's the leaves, the small new growth leaves of the soursop fruit tree, which we grow here as well. And so those, mm. those two together is really like a, a magical and very, very ancient combination. Mm. Wow. So that would be an anti-aging combination because it's black. Both of yes. them are black? Yeah. Well, the soursop's white and the, the – um, Chocolate sapote or black mm-hmm. sapote is black, so mm. we so you get so it's nice because you get that that interaction of opposites, which is what we're going to talk about as well. That well, I call it the the mystical union of opposites, playing on an ancient alchemical saying, which is unio mystico, the mystical union of opposites. So mm. you take things that are white and things that are black, and you mix them together. You take things that are red, you take things that are blue, and you mix them together. You know, there's always like this really fun dynamic you can get into when you're playing around with colors. Well, you know, the only thing that comes to mind when somebody says black to me are sea vegetables. Yes. And like bladder rack and even dulse is a purple black. Mm. And so you're right. There are many very dark sea vegetables and, you know, like nori lava is, is basically in its natural state. It's kind of like a purple black, like dulse is. 
And and so yes, there is a very strong gin component in many of the great seaweeds. And other black foods are like black sesame seed. Mm, oh yeah. And so so now there Western science has been aware of this for a while, even though we probably have never heard this. And they've been trying to figure out if there's something different about black foods. And there's a couple differences. One is they're dramatically higher in antioxidants than any other color food, sometimes as much as six times higher or more. The other thing that's very interesting is that black foods are higher in zinc. Mm. So if you, you take the same food, let's say black sesame seed, versus a white sesame seed, the black sesame seed is higher in zinc. And it's actually a, a property of all black foods. Like, for example, chaga mushroom, which you know I'm such a fan of, is, is like a yellow, brown, black. Well, it turns out it's also the highest content of zinc of any mushroom in the world. It's higher than any plant, and it's almost higher than any animal. The only animals that are higher in zinc then chaga mushroom is the, guess what, black ant. Oh, my gosh. You're kidding. Oh, that's right. Black ants. You can actually buy that from places like Ron Teagarden has that as a tincture sort of or, or an herb that you can just put dropper fulls in your mouth. Yes, exactly. Definitely known for anti-aging. I understand the women in China, the older women literally fight to get it into their, get hold of it. We, you know, we run a honey farm here. You know, that's one of the main things I'm doing out here in Hawaii and our Noni Land honey is, you know, we, we have it. It's a black honey, actually, and now that I think about wow. it. Um, but one of the things that happens is when you're playing around with honey here in the tropics, like in our kitchen, and we're opening the jar and closing it, and, and some of the, some of the um, honey gets on the outside, well, the ants come for it, right? And so sometimes they get into the honey, and, and we just put them in with everything else, you know, we just because they're already – they drowned in honey. They had a good death. So if you're eating your honey, you get some black ants, black covered ants anyway. <laughs> well, it wouldn't it wouldn't be any of the stuff that we distribute commercially, but oh, okay. it's it's in like our own personal stash because oh, it's interesting. When you're going in and out of the of the jar, you know, because we have these big like quart liter size things of honey in the kitchen, and and the ants will like sense that like, there's a little bit on the outside, you know what I mean, of the where the um, where the screws or would be for the lid. Hmm. And they they'll come and nibble there. Oh yeah, I'm sure. I can't imagine them avoiding that. I mean, who wouldn't go for that? Um, but go, getting back to the shaga, can you get the zinc from the shaga tea, or do you have to take the herb shaga? To get the that's zinc? a great question. So you can get it from the tea. Oh and, wow, really? And that's you know that makes shaga really one of the great zinc sources of all. And and that's one of the things I'm you know of course a big advocate of is getting connected to the mushroom kingdom, realizing mm-hmm. their importance for immunological soundness, and and for also rebuilding that healthy microbiome because those polysaccharides are some of the greatest prebiotics going. Um, it's basically it's it's probiotic food and immunological white blood cell food. So this is one of the reasons why I'm such an advocate of things like reishi mushroom and chaga mushroom and maitake and and agaricus blazei and some of the some of the greats in that category do you tend to put your shaga with another mushroom or do you tend to take it by yourself i always mix them together because where i live in so i have a farm in canada and then i have a farm in hawaii so in canada we're right in the middle of a, an incredible medicinal mushroom forest and we forage all our herbs wildly and those go into our teas in the winter, and I'll make some mix. But it always starts with a shaga and reishi. You know, that's the king and the queen. Mm-hmm. And then, then I'll go to like bluets or lobster mushrooms or oyster mushrooms or, you know, whatever whatever is in the forest. Um, we have lion's mane in the forest. All the great ones actually do grow in our forest, which is wonderful. I just started taking lion's mane because of the effect it has on the brain. It's to t- I'll tell you what, when you, when you find a wild lion's mane, it's really a sight to see. And the reason why they call it lion's mane is because it hangs down or it kind of droops into these little pointed, they're almost like teeth-like shapes. But from a distance, it looks does look like a lion. And it's, it's just a wonderful thing to find them. In fact, when you find them, you just kind of gently break them off of the tree and you literally would carry it all the way home because you don't want to damage it. And then you do your best you can to dry it in the sun. And then from there you make tea out of it. And then when you're done making tea out of it, you fish it out, you dry it again, and then you throw it into alcohol tinctures. 
Now, the drawing is really important, isn't it? Because I saw something on a PBS, I think it was a special, on, on mushrooms and how they're dried. And it was only when they were dried that, the, that they had the vitamin D content. That's correct. And that's been proven in numerous studies. The, the underside of the typical polypore, so for example, reishi mushroom is a very good example of a polypore. It is a mushroom that comes out like a shelf. And then on its underside, it has this kind of white coating. That's where the pores come out. That's why it's called a polypore. And there are millions of little tiny little pores there. If you turn that underside to the sun, the, the, that white material will convert over from ergosterol into vitamin D2. And that's, mm. that makes actually medicinal mushrooms a very important source of vitamin D in the winter in the extreme northern, northern climates. You know, it's so amazing because uh, you're an expert in these fields. I really don't know that much about them. I just know the basics. That's why people really need to go to a lot of different teachers today because it's sort of a, I mean, there's never been a time when people have had such extraordinary tools to be healthy. You're, you're right. You, we live in an incredible time where if you want to seek out what you, what you need to do to improve the health of your microbiome of your gut, if that information is out there, you can find those people like yourself. You can listen to them on a recording like this. Let's say you're, you're focusing on, like we were talking about the colors of foods, then you eventually track me down. And by the way, we can continue with that because, you know, I started yeah, with let's go on. Our- I was going to say, yeah, let's go with your story. I'm sorry. I kind of got off track there for you, but <laughs> that how'd was you fun, get though. into we this? Fun there. That was yeah, great. we picked up all kinds of good stuff. And I really didn't know about the polysaccharides being good for the gut. So that's a real plus for me. I really am just so excited about polysaccharide nutrition. Because what we're dealing with there is something that's really – it's a friendly bacteria food. It's, a, it's an immunological nutrient and it's not, a sh- it's not a, a, like a glucose sugar. It's not a, it's mm-hmm. not, it doesn't spike insulin. It has nothing to do with any of that. And, and, but your body can parse up those polysaccharides to be used as fuel later. Okay. Would you tell people where you find polysaccharides in foods? Because they, food, they are the food pr- most preferred by the bacteria in the gut. Okay, so let's say you're, um, let's say you live in like Los Angeles or you're in uh, Florida. Aloe vera, you know, the aloe vera gel is an incredible source of polysaccharides, one of the best in the world. We're, we're here in Hawaii. We have the great Polynesian superfruit here, which is noni. And when noni starts to get soft and pulpy, that pulpiness, if you bite into it, it's not sweet, that's for sure. It's like aloe vera. It's actually even higher in polysaccharides than aloe vera. You're up in, or you could be all the way from the tropics all the way to the boreal forest of Canada in North America or even Russia, and you'll find medicinal mushrooms growing out of trees. Those polysaccharides are water soluble. They'll come out into the water when you make a tea out of them, and you can get your polysaccharides that way. There's also polysaccharides in many different foods. For example, um, goji berries. You know, about 50% of the sugars in goji berries are polysaccharides, and they're medicinal and very well studied forms of polysaccharides. There are polysaccharides in oats. And out of all grains over the years, I think oats are the most correlated to longevity. Um, Mm -hmm. By the way, because we've been talking about color, black rice is the new brown rice. I just wanted to throw that out there. I love that. And bread too. I like the red rice. I get that from a Ron Tea Garden too. And um, it, it was Ron who started me, by the way, with the black foods and the red foods, right? Black is jing, oh, yeah. longevity, uh-huh. and, and red is heart and blood, but red is also volatile. You can't have too many red foods because you can actually, it's like, it's inflammatory. You know, it can inflame your system. Uh-huh. And so that's the trick of red. And that's why, like, red meat. If somebody's really deficient in jing and they're really deficient in, in blood, you know, uh-huh. according to that, to Taoist and Chinese medicine theory, yeah. uh-huh. then, then, you know, the, all of a sudden they eat red meat and they feel better. I mean, you've seen that, I'm sure, over the years with vegans who get really deficient in blood, then they eat red meat and then everything's fine. All of a sudden they're like back to normal. But then we see the opposite as well, which is people eat red meat every day and they get completely inflammatory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good it, point. So, so you, have to, you have to watch red, it's, you know, which is, I find to be interesting because it kind of makes sense that you would watch red because it's like flame. It's like a fire. Well, also uh, the red has the red yeast rice in it. You know, red yeast rice is used um, for heart disease, which is interesting, uh, but you can, you can overdo on that too. So that's good to know to use that in moderation. Uh, it, I love these colored rices though. They have more body to them, more flavor. They're more interesting to eat. Uh, but yeah, you, I agree. You, you mentioned the oats 
And it's interesting that you said that because I've got, you know, usually um, because I started off working with people with candida, that to go off of all grains completely and then, uh, you know, they can, after they've got their yeast infection under control, they would um, introduce them. If you've got a real serious gut problem, you can't even have quinoa and millet. The things I recommend, uh, they're fine for if you just, if your gut's okay, but you're just fighting your candidiasis, you know, and, and in body ecology, we've got the um, quinoa and millet and so on, uh, amaranth and buckwheat, those are fine. But then eventually people can go, once they've established a healthy inner ecosystem, they're eating fermented foods, if they prepare them properly, they can um, go back into um, some grains. But the first, but I like these dark black, I like the black and the red rice and I like oats. So it's so interesting that you're in agreement on this. And the thing I always try to warn people about oats is to buy the whole oats, like the kind you buy that, that, that they feed to horses. It looks like rice, but it's yellow, darker and yellow. And so I want to ask you about the yellow color. But, um, you know, if you just buy oat meal, what they do is they bring those that, the oats in from the field, they slice them up, and then they pack them in a jar. And so they have nasty stuff in them, like legs and larvae and dirt. And, uh. No, it's awful to eat oatmeal. So I always tell people, buy the grain, the whole grain, you know, soak it for at least eight hours and wash it well, and then cook it very slowly for a long time. Like I like for people to put it in water and let it cook for a while because it's so much easier to digest if you do that. I think a lot of people are against grains because they don't know to eat them with fermented foods, don't overeat on them, uh, prepare them properly, and so on. Uh, then they become very beneficial again for the gut. So wanted to throw that out there too. But let's get into the, the So, okay, so oats are yellow. Yeah, so let's talk about yellow because yellow was the next color that came up for me actually. So I started – what happened was is that each of these colors has a code. So I want to give you that code as to what their general property is. For example, red is blood and it's heart, but it's volatile. Got to be careful. Mm. Orange, anti-inflammatory or gold. So the yellow, gold, orange is all kind of one color. They're tissue building. They're tissue repair. They're anti-inflammatory. They're immunological in that vitamin C type of way, you know, where they purify like the sun, but not in the mushroom type of way where they create a deep, long-term immunological strength or yellow, gold, orange is more like a vitamin C kind of like, you know, hit it and, and, and do the job, but then, you know, it's not something that's going to last that continues to build over time. Whereas the polysaccharides do, that's been shown that like, for example, beta glucans, if you take it repeatedly every day, like beta glucans is in all the medicinal mushrooms. Mm -hmm. If you repeatedly and consistently take medicinal mushrooms or beta glucans, it creates an immunological momentum, which is a totally different type of thing than, than what I'm talking about with like the yellow, orange and gold color, which is, you know, that sun energy, that vitamin C energy, that ozone energy, which is like kind of, you know, kill off the bad guys, but then there's, you know, you have to do it again tomorrow. What do you have growing there in the farm that's yellow? Oh, we've got all kinds of things. I've got gingers here. They're gingers. Mm. I mean, we've got a whole ginger collection. We've got yellow cacaos, yellow chocolate fruits here, quite a few of them. We have the noni. I mean, noni comes in yellow and then can turn it actually into an opaque white. So mm. it it's varies between those colors. We have yellow papayas, and, and they go all the way from yellow to gold to orange, and that has to do with their content of, for example, alpha carotene, lutein, which is yellow. And then if you go all the way to beta carotene, then you're at an orange. And, and so by the way, these compounds, the colored pigments that are in our food, they're actually the strongest antioxidants that are in the food. You know, they're anywhere from three to 50 times more powerful than vitamin C. And they are usually, not always, but usually fat soluble. So for example, beta carotene, it's fat soluble. Uh, lycopene, which is what's in our tomatoes, is fat soluble. And there's a whole coming science of this that I've been working with. And, and I'm just literally, I started a book on this subject on it called The Color Cure. I got mm. 600 pages into it, and I'm not even close. I mean, I think it's going to go another 400 pages. And what I will, wow. what I'm going to do, I mean, if you've been, if anybody's listening right now has been following my work for any period of time, I was going to release it this April, but it's probably going to actually going to be a couple of years before I release this book because <laughs> wow. yeah. I want to get it to like, like a thousand page book with all the colors, the whole story behind each color, all the color pigments, recipes, everything all together like a big giant kind of hardcover book. 
Well, when you said they're fat soluble, are you saying that you should eat them with fat or? Well, okay. This is what's okay. been discovered. Let's say, let's say you wanted to maximize your uptake of lycopene, which is in tomatoes. Mm-hmm. Th- th- this is what the science indicates. If you blend the tomatoes, you absorb the lycopene better than if you just tried to eat it raw. Because that makes sense because you're when you blend, you're exposing more surface area, so you're more likely to absorb. But the difference isn't great. It's about 5% or 4% more if you blend versus just eat it because we don't chew enough, obviously. And then the next step is if you blend it with some kind of a fat present, let's say it was olive oil or avocado or you know whatever your favorite coconut nut or oil, seed is, coconut, or coconut oil, coconut milk maybe, coconut milk, mm-hmm. almond milk, whatever, um, that you will increase the uptake of that lycopene significantly, even up to forty mm. percent. So when, if you just wow. eat it, you're, you're re- we're really looking at like five percent absorption of lycopene. If you eat it or if you blend it and drink it, you're getting you know maybe ten percent. But if you Blend it with oil or something fatty, like a, like an almond milk or or a coconut oil. Mm-hmm. You're going to get up to forty percent uptake of that lycopene. Now, here's where it gets crazy. the The research indicates that if you heat it up at that point, so you blended it with oil, and now you've heated it up, so it's not boiling, but it's it's just like that sipping temperature where it's it's too hot to drink it, but you're just kind of like spooning it in that your uptake will go up to about 60% of that lycopene, which is 12 times higher than eating it. So you're recommending to heat it? Yes. Now, listen, I mean, how now, would you do that, though? Like you've made a smoothie or something with the fruit and the coconut oil. Now how, what are you gonna, how are you going to heat it? Well, it, the smoothie, smoothies aren't the best thing heated <laughs> ever. So no, I haven't seen that ever. <laughs> if it's a morning smoothie, probably not. But let's say it's an evening thing and you were making a soup, uh-huh. it, it, you'll absorb more of the, or the antioxidant content, the carotenoids mm. in particular, the beta carotene, the lycopene, the lutein, the zeaxanthin, the alpha carotene, and all of those color pigments that are in the vegetable world or vegetable fruit world. You know, for example, tomato is a vegetable fruit. Goji uh-huh. berry is a vegetable fruit. Uh-huh. It has vegetable pigments in it. That red in a goji berry is lycopene, just like a tomato. Now, lycopene is very good for what? Lycopene is an extraordinary blood builder and blood protector. It's red, so obviously it has very powerful effects on blood and heart, but it's also immunological and very powerfully immunological. Now, this is something that the research indicates that I've actually found it actually has correlated to my experience, that if you do a heavy amount of, for example, tomato soup, you know, I've been doing tomato basil soups with chia seed in there and and a uh, little bit of garlic, a little bit of onion, a little bit of oregano, thyme, um, rosemary, you know, that kind of flavoring it out that way, a little bit of cashew. If you make soups like that, and, and I, you know, our, our, I have a blender that does that, the Nutribullet RX, it's designed to do that, by the way. That's why we designed it that way, to extract those lycopene, the lycopene and the lutein and the beta carotene. Mm-hmm. What, what ends up happening is, is that if you do that consistently, you feel what the research indicates you should feel, which is about a 72-hour lift. Like, it's an antioxidant lift, but it's also an immunological lift. And I've had that experience of just doing only those kind of soups when I'm, for example, on TV. Sometimes I'll be at the TV studio for 24 hours. Like, I'll be there all day and all night, and I'll just live on those kind of soups. And so I've been really tuning in. It's like, okay, does this – Do I, am I feeling what the research indicates I should be feeling? And the answer, I have to say, is yes. Yes, there, it, it's way different. And so what we're driving at is that the food we already have, like tomatoes or you know whatever it is you want, you know, goji berries or whatever, or it could be anything in the melon family, by the way, because all of those melon, that whole melon family is all vegetable pigments, fat-soluble pigments, that you can actually get a lot more out of that food based on how you prepare it. Mm-hmm. And what you're really getting a lot more of is the color pigment, interestingly. So you're saying that the Nutribullet RX is better extracting these nutrients, and then how are you heating it? Yeah, it's, it's heated by friction, just like a, of the old Vitamix. Theory. Oh, yeah, you just keep it going, and then it just starts it to get, get hot again. And it does it automatically. So we just created it. So you hit one button, it goes for six minutes and 45 seconds. It shuts off, and it's perfectly piping hot, and so it's done mm, everything amazing. for you. So, for example, if I make a tomato basil soup, the – the thing I'll put in there is chia seed and olive oil and a little bit of cashews, like maybe eight to ten cashews in there. And then lots of lots of my favorite herbs go in there. 
onions, garlic, oregano, thyme, that kind of stuff. And then it basically in six minutes and 45 seconds, it's a perfect delivered soup mm, right there. And, and it's designed that way based on the research from the color cure. And I thought that that was just a very important thing to express that like, whoa, this is indicating something we've suspected all along, which is the way we're eating the food is just as important as what food we're eating. I know. I am glad, so glad you said that. Um, people would always say years ago that the food's only good for you if it's raw. But I literally came across science and, um, you know, there's food scientists who study this all the time. And broccoli, if you heat it, is, um, I was trying to think, what was it exactly? There's certain nutrients. Oh, I remember it became higher in antioxidants when it was heated versus raw. And of course, raw, I mean, really raw broccoli is very hard to digest. You have to have really strong digestion to digest raw broccoli. And, and I like raw broccoli, but I don't recommend it for most people. It, to digest those little florets, is, you have to have a lot of digestive fire. Mm-hmm. And but, but what about green? Because broccoli is green. Okay, so green is actually a mixture of two colors, which is green and yellow. Mm. Now, we've seen that. We've detected that before. And that has to do with the ratio of lutein and zeaxanthin to chlorophyll. And they're always together, by the way. So beta carotene, for example, is always present with chlorophyll. You'll always find these carotenoids with chlorophyll. They're mixed together. So what, what I'm driving at is like your kale or your spinach never turns yellow. It already is yellow. It's just that the chlorophyll is breaking down and now you see the yellow. That's an important distinction to make. Yellow is, in my opinion, from my research on color, the first color that arises out of the twilight of red, of gray and black and white and silvers. Isn't that so, interesting because the sun is yellow and I think we all, always have a love for that color. Yellow is happiness. It, it, and it mm -hmm. is, by the way, what's interesting, one of the great yellow compounds that's in our food is quercetin. Mm, and oh, quercetin has yeah. now been correlated to be likely the candidate as to what causes St. John's wort's antidepressant qualities, which I find to be interesting because it's yellow. So it causes happiness. Mm, interesting. Yeah. I say quercetin mentioned a lot when I go to when some of the modules I've attended at A4M. Quercetin shows up as a very excellent supplement to take. So now you're getting it from food, which is even better. And you're going to get it on a regular basis if you're eating this all the time. Um, so green, like, is there anything else you want to say about green? Because, you know, dark green leafy vegetables, kale, collards, I mean, everybody, I think, tries to put green into their diet every day. Green is the neutralizer, the deodorizer, the detoxifier, the liver cleanser. It's absolutely necessary in the world that we live in today. I mean, I'll take green powders and I'll do neti pots with them. I mean, I, that's how strong I feel about chlorophyll, you know, going through my body. I mean, that's, you know, everywhere, every direction. This is the whole thing of doing wheatgrass enemas. You uh -huh. know, you, you just get that green into everything and get it touching everything because chlorophyll is a very powerful heavy metal detoxifier. Chlorophyll is a very powerful blood builder. Chlorophyll, you know, this is something amazing. And I, and I, I have to believe that ancient, the ancients were onto it. You know the whole thing of the squaring of the circle, that whole alchemical riddle? That's exactly what chlorophyll is. It's a circle and a square together. It's a square planar arrangement with a circular group of ions in it, in the very center of its magnesium. So it's a circle and a square at the same time. Well, now, do you explain this in the color cure? Because this is a I whole do. body of information no one will have ever heard before, and nor will they get it anywhere else. It's what I loved about this book is I went through about a thousand peer reviewed studies. So it's really, I, I, there's no other way to go because I can't rely on books that aren't scientific for this subject matter because, you know, you know, I, of course I'm going to read them. I read Steiner, I read Goethe, I read Newton, their theories on color. But ultimately, when it comes to the actual structure of the pigment, the structure of chlorophyll, you got to go to where, you know, what our scientific theory is. And by the way, I want to say something about that. There's a huge discovery in there that came to light for me, and that is every color is associated with a shape. That's, that was a mind bender, and this is the correlation. It starts with yellow. Yellows have the simplest shapes of all color pigments. Then it goes to orange. Then it goes to red. Then it goes to green. Then it goes to purple. Then it goes to brown, black. Then it goes to blue. Blue is by far the most complex of all shapes it, symmetrically 
uh, organizationally for nature to produce a blue pigment is very difficult. And in fact, most cases, nature will fake a blue. Instead of actually producing the blue pigment, it will use color refraction or structural coloration. The structure of the eye, the structure of the feather will make you think there's a blue there, but there really isn't. There's only a brown or a black there. Hmm. Now, why do the shapes matter? And how well, did you so, discover that? I said this is the very first I've ever heard of shapes with color. This, this to me has to do with organization and symmetry. It has to do with efficiency. So in looking at like how in the world did color even arise? I mean, first of all, there came an idea that just was a bender for me completely, which is there was a time before color. There was a time in the universe before there was colored objects, before color existed. And that colored substances are more symmetrical. They're, the molecules are more organized and they follow a very specific pattern. I started to see it. I started to go, oh, okay, I know what that is. That's going to be a yellow. You can actually show me, Donna. You can take any molecule. You can throw it up there, and I can tell you what color it's going to be. That's and, fascinating. And, wow. And that's, so a time before of time before color, um, I mean, our eyes, do you think there was ever a time when, when I know other animals can't see color? I don't think dogs can see color, can they? Not and as our, well as us. And then do, um, we have the eyes to see that. Is that just part of the evolution of what occurred? and? development of life on the earth i mean first there was shapes and structure and then eventually color came in other words it was a color colorless world once upon a time possibly i mean i think that the colorless universe came before probably before the earth Mm -hmm. Um, but there are there are throwbacks to the colorless universe before things had become more organized or evolved or developed to create the complexity that could create a yellow and then the yellow eventually led to an orange and the orange led to a red and the red led to a green and the green led to a purple and the purple led to a brown. You know, all of that kind of stuff is probably pre-consciousness or what, you know, whatever, whatever your theory of the universe is um, or pre our kind of consciousness. But we have, there's a sense that there's a throwback to that time. For example, let me tell you one that I've seen here in, in Hawaii which is a rainbow cast by the moon. When the full moon casts a rainbow, not a, not a moon bow around the moon, but an actual rainbow cast by the light of the moon. Hmm. It, it's actually one of the most brilliant things you've ever seen, which what it is, is, is it's a rainbow, but it, instead of it being red, orange, yellow, green, indigo, violet, it's not that. It's actually shades of silvers and grays and whites and blacks. It's one of the most incredible atmospheric phenomenon that you can see in your lifetime. So there's no color in it. There's no color in it. Wow, amazing. Now I think people will start to look up in the sky more and they'll, maybe they are seeing a rainbow. They're just not, they were looking for color, but there's other types of rainbows. Um, did you, um, as far as blue goes though, now when I go to Florida, and, and particularly when I'm on the West Coast in a place like Rosemary Beach or Seaside, The water there is absolutely beautiful. It's a beautiful teal blue. And now you've got me wondering, is that a fake blue or is it a real blue? Like, how do you tell the difference? And what are some examples of blue foods besides blueberries? Good question. Okay, this is what Rudolf Steiner said and Goethe said. So I think it, it makes sense. When you're standing in light and you're looking into darkness, the light will refract towards blue. So, for example, if you're standing on the earth in the middle of the day and you look up in the sky, you see blue. Well, it's all immense blackness out there. But for whatever reason, when you stand in light and you look into darkness, you see blue. When you stand in darkness, like when the sun's rising and you look into light, according to Goethe, you see yellow. But according to Steiner, you see red. Now, this is completely different, by the way, than the, than the Newton theory, which is the two colors, you know, that Newton said that all light is, all the colors are derived from, from white light. Steiner and Goethe had a completely different theory in that they're saying, no, there's two forces, light and darkness, not to be confused with like the Prince of Darkness or anything like that, but just two different forces. And where they meet, there's an interference field and that interference field creates color. I actually believe that theory. I'm not into the Newton theory. I think Newton's theory is actually incorrect. Mm -hmm. Uh, But when we get into blue pigments, like for example, water is going to be refract to blue. Like if you're standing in light and you look into the dark ocean, you're going to see blue. But water also absorbs the other colors better than it does blue 
so it will reflect more blue to you so it'll appear blue. So there's two things going on with water. One is you're standing in light, like in the middle of the day, looking into the ocean, you'll see blue for two reasons. One is you're standing in light, looking into darkness. The second reason is water, actually, the water molecule does reflect blue better than the other colors. It absorbs the other colors better. And so therefore, it's going to appear a little bit more blue or clear blue than most other molecules would appear. And what about blue in food? I mean, is, are blueberries really blue or are they fake blue? Great question. The answer is they are really blue. They do actually have blue pigments in them. They also have purple pigments in them, as we know. But there, there are true blue pigments in blueberries. And there are also, and it's, by the way, it arises from the minerals in the soil. The minerals in the soil will control that. For example, if you go to the big island of Hawaii into the crater, you will see blueberries there, but they're red. Oh, it's the darndest thing you've ever seen. It, you eat it, and you go, that's a blueberry, but the thing's red. And the reason it has to do with its different minerals there and the, the actual anthocyanin cannot produce a blue there because the right mineral and control of the alkalinity of the vacuole where the color is sitting in the skin, can, it, it's not, there's not the right alkaline mineral that's present, and it will use an acidic mineral instead, and therefore the color goes from – Instead of being a blue or purple blue, it'll turn to a complete red. Mm, wow. But they taste like blueberries, so you know you're eating they, a blueberry, yeah, right? Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Yes. It's huh. one of the best things ever. What a magical place to go to. Super magical. What about glasses? You know, people pick sunglasses, for example, that have different colored lens. What do you think about that? Good or bad? Great question, and and uh, you know I'm be- I'm becoming an expert in this area. I'm probably not the leading expert, but I I have learned enough to use a program on my computer called Flux. I'd recommend that people get. I think it's Flux online. You could get it F L U X. And what it does, it late at night it blocks out the blue part of the spectrum from your computer screen. You can turn it off at any time. But what that does is it, it it'll keep your eyes happier and healthier longer and you'll be able to look at that computer screen longer the blue end of the spectrum can damage your eyes um and that's what we've learned from all these you know decades of now computer of tv screens and computer screens it's really the blue that can create problems as you go on and actually what flux does is it changes to more of the yellows which are easier on the eye than the blue late at night you you start to really notice a difference when you've been using flux for months and all of a sudden you turn it off and you go, whoa, that blue light is like you can really detect it. Now, you can't use Flux if you're a graphic artist because it's not going to allow you to see the, the full color spectrum in a natural way because it's blocking out the blue. It's a blue blocker. Um, and this is to be said also with blue bo- blocker glasses, that there's something to be said for them that protects your eyes. Blue blockers protect your eyes. Now, there's different types of blue blocking technology out there in sunglasses. I haven't followed that in a while, but I'd say it's overall a good thing if you have damaged eyes and if you have very light eyes in heavy sunshine. Mm. And it's okay, though, to eat blueberries for the eyes. The blue is good for eating, right? Yes, absolutely. Just so people don't get confused and stop eating blueberries thinking it's bad for their eyes. Very good point. In fact, I'd say the blue pigment is one of the most important pigments for the eyes. As it really turns out, you do need all the pigments. You, you need the yellows. That's lutein. You're going to need the um, you're going to, you need the carotenoid, zeaxanthin, the orange. You need the blueberry. You know th- these are key eye nutrients. And then for you know to some degree, you could also say things like astaxanthin, which is a red. But that's another key nutrient for the eyes. So we could probably find an example of every single color being good for the eyes. Well, let's talk about animal protein for a second because. They come in different colors, too. There's lamb and beef and buffalo. They're red. But then you've got your chicken. Uh, so what do you, uh, does this apply for animal proteins, too? Yes. And, in fact, um, for example, it's like the dark meat of chicken. Uh, you know, it has oh, more, yeah. mm-hmm. more quick-twitch fibers in it. So, actually, it turns out that – and this is, this is something you should look into. Um, if you're listening right now, check it out. The, the actual dark meat is better for you. It has more B vitamins in it. And it has more zinc in it. There is that zinc thing coming back in again. And so the thing about like white meat or dark meat, you actually really want the dark meat. 
I only eat dark meat. And also, um, it's much more flavorful, I think. I, the, to me, a breast is kind of blah, unless it's cooked really well. But I always prefer the dark meat. I heard that a long time ago, too, that it's much healthier, has many more nutrients. Now, you said something, I heard somebody, uh, somebody I think maybe it said something to me at the conference that we were at about hair turning gray. Is there a relationship to beauty, skin, hair, and so on, nails with these minerals, with these colors? Absolutely. And, and the food to go after, are, there's two, two sets of foods to go after. One is mm-hmm. you got to go after the real jing-supporting black foods and herbs. And for, for beauty, for hair color? I mean, somebody actually said color. to me, oh, David said yeah. so-and-so about gray hair. And I thought, well can you tell me what he said? And they didn't finish the sentence. They didn't know they were asking me. And I thought, I don't know what he said. I would love to know that. So great question. And there's, there's a lot of depth to it. We're going to go, well, let's go through the whole depth of it. First of all, just on the basic thing is you, you want to have black foods as just jing and longevity. And there is a genetic component to graying and we want to postpone that as long as possible. And it's possible to do that using shaga using Hoshu Wu, the great brown black herb of Chinese medicine, Ramania root, which is one of the great black roots of Chinese medicine. Um, some of the great, um, what, what, Yakomi is another black herb in Chinese medicine that I really, really like because it creates very flexible and tough tendons and tissue. And it's great if you're kind of a rough and tumble type of person where you like to get out there on, on the weekend and just really have a lot of fun. So there's that level of it. Well, that, that's so interesting because those, you just named a whole bunch of anti-aging herbs. That's, I mean, it's, I just was, as you were listing them off, I'm thinking, wow, every single one of them is, is known for anti-aging. Hey, Shibu is known for people, you know, people that are taking it, their hair stays darker. Yes. So interesting. And so then there's the, the Ann Wigmore theory, which is you want to get, and this, this fits in right with your teachings, is you want to get these live cultured foods because you're going to get those live enzymes and B vitamins, which have a, an effect on allaying the aging process and also affect a change in, in the hair and improve the quality of your hair, your skin, your nails, because the young plants have more silica. And as, as they the young, I'm sorry, the young, yeah, the young plants have more silica. And then as they mature, they produce more calcium. So that's mm-hmm. kind of like this idea of sprouts and sprout juice and, you know, Ann Whitmore used to do this thing of like taking sprouts and then fermenting the sprout water. You know, the plant was sprouting in and then drinking that. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So there, there's that whole angle. And then let's go a little bit deeper. It turns out that, that most of the aromatic compounds or the, the flavor smell, the smell of food, so the things that cause it to smell like vanilla, mm-hmm. the aromatic compounds and the color compounds are related chemically. And they're related because they're all built out of one amino acid, which is tyrosine. Wow, that's an important amino amino for the front of the brain, prefrontal cortex, very essential for the thyroid. And right, and then super essential for producing the the fundamental building blocks of aromatic compounds, things that give smell and flavor oh. and color. And so when you start to develop tyrosine up a few steps, it turns into DOPA, L-DOPA. So depending on how you want to approach it, for example, Makuna, I'm a huge fan of Makuna, I grow Makuna, Um, I eat Makuna every day when I'm at home, Makuna is super high in L-DOPA and DOPA is a tyrosine built molecule and it is the immediate precursor to your melanin. So it goes from there into a betalane type of molecule and then starts to rack together and form into melanin. And you've got to have melanin to keep your hair from turning gray. Uh Aha. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What about serotonin? Because you're thinking of L-dopa, dopamine, a brain chemical. Uh, Do you think yellow has anything to do with serotonin? Absolutely. Yeah, there's no question about it, actually. What's interesting is that there's only one other pigment group that's formed out of amino acids, and they're formed out of the tryptamine pathway, actually. There's one, so there's colors are mo- almost the lion's share of color pigments in our food, and everything we see that is actually a color pigment is made out of tyrosine and, and phen- phenylalanine. But, mm-hmm. you know, because tyrosine and phenylalanine are made out of each other, so they're all in that same group. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But there's a small fraction of color pigments that are made out of the tryptamine group, and serotonin's in that group. And they are almost always yellows. 
Mm. What made me think of that when you were talking about the uh, putting the flux on and blocking out the blue light and, le- and you're going more toward the yellow, I thought, I wonder if that also then would stimulate serotonin so people would sleep better. Uh, it, and I was wondering, it, yes. that's when my first question came up was, uh, is serotonin related to yellow? So that would be great. The blue light does cause a problem with sleeping, and that's why late at night on your computer, you got to be careful about that blue light. Again, when you start using a program like Flux, maybe there's other ones. I don't know. Flux is just super easy to use. The whole thing's on and going within 30 seconds. You're you're up and running. Wow. Um, you, you start and then you turn it off and on in the middle of the night. You start going, my God, what was I dealing with before? That was It's really shocking on the eyes to have that level of blue light, and it does disturb sleep patterns. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? You just amaze me. Every single year, you amaze me because you come out with the most interesting things, the most useful things. You're just a gift to the world, David. And I love, everyone loves your enthusiasm. But this book, this whole, I mean, we've all loved vegetables. We've all known how important vegetables were. But now it's like you've given us a whole different understanding of color. And I think this is going to make people better vegetable eaters now. I mean, who who could never, well, proteins too, because as you said, they have color in them. But I've always said we need at least an 80% plant-based diet. And bringing this whole element in about color is amazing. It, I, I really like color because it's so simple and everybody understands it. And I wanted to, be, before we're done here, Don, I just want to go over the, the colors and, and their effects again because we okay. only got through red, orange, and yellow. Now, red, remember, that was blood building, heart strengthening, but still volatile. you got to be careful. Orange and yellow and the gold in between, is, those are anti-inflammatories, tissue building, tissue repair. Some of the great um, vitamins, for example, vitamin B9, folate, it's yellow, and, it, that's, and it's tissue building, right, because – that's what you need when you get pregnant. You have to have those yellows. You get into vitamin B2. Vitamin B2 is like orange, and it can go orange to even into little tiny bit green. It's a flavin. You know, the riboflavins, the flavins actually have a color. And then green, that's a neutralizer, deodorizer, detoxifier, liver cleanser. We talked about that. But blue has to do with bone marrow and recreating yourself and stem cell production and and eyes and throat and thyroid protection and, and neurological defenses. And blue is a super key color pigment to be going after. That's why I'm a fanatic about blueberries. That's why I'm a fanatic about phycocyanin, you know, the great blue mm-hmm. pigment, blue green algae. Oh, yeah. And then brown, that has to do with your intestines, your digestive tract, which makes sense. That's why, I like, you know, brown coffee, people drink their coffee in the morning and boom, it's immediate bowel movement. Mm. Almost all laxatives are brown or brown yellow. Um, purple, central nervous system protector, protects the brain and the eyes, but also gut nervous system protector. Interesting distinction there. So there, we have two nervous systems, as you know. We have the nervous yeah, system of our yeah. brain and our eyes and that, that central nervous system. But we also have a gut nervous system, and they're protected by the color purple. So give um, us some example of purple foods. You didn't, we didn't talk about those. Oh, like I, purple grapes, okay. um, Saskatoon berries, purple sweet potato. Oh, it, yeah. you, it, for me personally, I would really put purple sweet potato up there as one of the great brain protectors of all. Wow, amazing all to know yes. that. And uh, by the way, out of all complex carbohydrates, I'm going to put purple sweet potato at the very top. That's my pick. As wow. the number one complex well, card. I hope the store starts stocking up on those because when you say that, it, there's going to be a mad rush. <laughs> and, I, and I'm a- going to be buying some today, actually, for sure. Oh, I right. love those little things. But, um, you know, when they first came out, I thought, what are these? I mean, what are they good for? So now I know that's great. I love, I love them, too. I just intuitively feel they're really good for you. Now I know. That's amazing that they're so good. Yeah, and that's, that's one that's really – it's the product of really all the research from – the, the biodynamic farming perspective to the anthocyanin research to the, uh, the you know, for example, some of the greatest athletes in the world like Usain Bolt. or What was his name? That's his name, isn't it? Usain Bolt, the fastest man in the world. What they asked his father, you know, like, well, what did this kid eat growing up? Sweet potato every day. And it's that mm. tropical sweet potato that's, you know, that grows so well in the Caribbean. Almost all of those are anthocyanin rich. So they create that quick reflexes. Right, because mm-hmm. that's a nervous system thing. 
Mm -hmm. um, so then the next two colors, one of them is white. So white is white's the pigment that's not there. People ask me like, which pigment is white? Well, it's not there. It's when there is no pigment there, um, but it will be white. That's lungs. That's your that's your source energy, and it's immune system too. White has a lot to do with the immune system, as do yellows. And What's then white. White. So Color cauliflower rice. would be white. Yeah, oh, cauliflower yeah, yeah, would be yeah. white. Or you know, for example, many of the great roots that we love so much, like astragalus. Astragalus is a white. And then we go to black, and black is the color of some of these great super herbs that we've talked about. We even talked about chocolate or black sapote, and black is also going to be present in many of the great um, super foods of the world. And, and, of course, you mentioned the seaweeds. The, I am really partial to those purple, brown, black seaweeds. I think they are some of the greatest things ever, and, and when I think about bladder rack, for example, for iodine, there, it may have no equal. I mean, I think it may even be superior to kelp and iodine. And, and iodine is essential for the thyroid. Actually, what's interesting about iodine is that iodine, as an independent isolated molecule, actually is a purple. And if you have a whole bunch of iodine together, it's purple black. Are you getting a lot of questions from people about sea vegetables today because of the radiation and the polluted ocean? Or people are, are afraid of them. It's, it's absolutely. I, I, I overhear stuff in health food stores. I overheard a conversation the other day that was so funny. This woman was at she was she was shopping for like salmon or something, and and then she was she said something to the guy who was at the counter there, the guy who's cutting up the fish and all that. And I'm like listening in, and she says to this guy, she says. Yeah, like, you know, I'm into seaweed, but there's, like, so much radiation in, like, the ocean. You know, I don't really eat seaweed anymore. And um, which one of these fish has, like, the least radiation in it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> As if he's got on special glasses that can see that. And, you know, just for everybody to remember, radiation, you can't taste it. You can't see it. You can't smell it. You can't even detect it unless you have special equipment. That's why we need to get rid of it. Because it's so difficult to deal with, we can come up with better ways to produce energy. You know, sea vegetables actually have some research showing that they're anti-irradiation as a food. And the other thing I always tell people is that we are really going through a screwed up time. We have run so many, our food, our water, our air, and it's going to take a while before we clean things up. I hope we clean them up. But the thing is, until we do, if we're eating fermented foods like cultured vegetables, for example, you've got the bacteria in there. And one of their jobs is to scavenge out the toxins. So I always feel a little safer, definitely a lot safer, actually, knowing that more and more people are eating these foods today. And they understand about the gut microbes because we need them. They're like, they always have been survival foods for people. And they still are today. I think that's so important, and they can they do all kinds of magic tricks. I had a guy down the road here, here in Hawaii. There's an area that was old pineapple farms that was sprayed with DDT. About it's about you know ten miles down the road, and this guy was farming there, and he had proven to the state of Hawaii that he could detoxify the soil of DDT with soil microbes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. They've been and, doing that for a while. Yeah, that's great. To and I mean, what a, what a lesson about the importance of the microbiome. We're, yeah, we are exposed to all kinds of toxins. And I'll put money on the, the friendly bacteria can detoxify a lot of what's out there if we have enough of them and if we give them what they need. You know what? I'm going to throw a challenge out at you as we're ending up here. All right. I want you to go back to that color cure book because we're all holding our breaths now for it to come out. But um, I wonder if there's any connection between the bacteria and this color. Do they, you know, like this, just a thought. Food for yes, absolutely. There are different colored bacteria. And that's an, I'd have to review my notes on that because it's been a while since I, that was last summer when I was digging into that. But this is really interesting. There are many yellow bacteria. There are ah. many bacteria that form color pigments. And yes, there is, a, there is a, an aspect of the whole color cure that is bacteria related for sure. Oh, great. Yeah, because, you know, they're in the soil and they must, must be having some kind of effect on the color of that plant in some way. So you've got to have a chapter on that in the book. Okay, you got it. <laughs> okay. That's a good idea, Thank actually. You, Thank you, David, so much for being with us today. I know everybody's going to need to listen to today's talk a bunch of times. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me and have the best day ever.